Ми в ефірі, пан Артем. Доброго дня, я можу починати, так? Так, звісно. Hello to everybody. My name is Artem Bondar. I am a Lviv guide. Uh, I work in this position already 17 years. And uh, today I'd like to give you a tour around Lviv castles, about, uh, about castles of Lviv region. Um, well, you know, the territory of Western Ukraine, or as local people call it, Galicia is a very ancient territory with long and interesting history and full of historical objects. And um, today, during the quarantine times, a uh, big pity that uh, not many people could, could visit it. So today we'd like to give you an online tour and it will be in fact a teaser for you because normally such tour would last about six, seven hours of traveling and examining the castles and museums inside. But today we try to make a tour through one hour and um, examine the best highlights of this uh, spectacular places. But before we speak about our castles, I'd like to give you a brief history of uh, this territory so you better understand who, when, and why build them, what purpose, and in what period. Well, first of all, we must say that this land always was, as we joke, the wild east of Europe. And uh, the territory of great Rus was always under um, danger of invasion of Eastern steppe nomads. So when uh, ancient Ukrainians, Rusin people invited Vikings to become the first dynasty of our kings, those Vikings was astonished when uh, they see this land. When they saw it, uh, they call it Hardarik or Gardarika, which literally means the land of the castles and fortresses. Pretty much each big settlement in that time uh, used to have some fortress. It could be a fortified line of walls around the settlement. It could be a fortified monastery or um, a church with a thick walls and shooting halls where half a village can hide and uh, fight back on enemies. And all this uh, fortresses was um, situated like 15, 12 kilometers from each other. So if enemy would attack you, you can make a pile of uh, pillar of smoke or uh, signed by a fire and your neighbor will come with his regiment to help you. So if you look on the map, these castles uh, really look like a horseshoe from north through east to south to protect Lviv and its region from the eastern general invasion. Well, on the territory of the western Ukraine, on the territory of Lviv region, you would find more than 20 different fortresses. And in the neighboring Ternopil region, there is more than 50 of them. So really this land was uh, very uh, reinforced. And uh, today we're gonna speak about three main castles, uh, as we call them, castles of a golden horseshoe, because in, in one period, in the 17th century, all these three castles belong to King of, of Poland. So it was a residence uh, often visited by a king and his court. And the first castle about where, which we'll speak, it's a castle in a village called Olesko. It's situated um, 80 kilometers from Lviv uh, along the uh, Kiev road. And uh, this castle um, bears the name of a village. Olesko in Ukrainian, could be translated as um, edge of the woodland. So really, if you look on the territory, um, it's the end of a very dense forest covering the neighboring hills and the beginning of a huge uh, valley, which was covered by marshlands even uh, 100 years ago. And still now around the castle, you can find lots of swamp and marshlands. Historicals claim that nearby the Olesko castle on the hill, was a huge settlement. In fact, in one moment, this settlement was even bigger than the capital Kiev. It was called Plisnesk. But then when Mongols invade this territory, they decide to siege Plisnesk. And the territory was so big that it was merely impossible to cover all the line of walls. So lots of refugees run away from the city. Generally, uh, this uh, settlement was totally destroyed and never been rebuilt. So refugees decided to build a new castle, which will be 
hard to destroy uh, for Mongols in next uh, campaign. And uh, you must understand that till 13th, 14th century, uh, biggest amount of buildings on this territory was built from wood. Traditionally, we have acres and acres of forests and to process wood was much uh, and timber was much more easier than to process a stone. So people here live in wooden cities and surrounded by wooden uh, walls reinforced by soil. But new technology, new artillery uh, machines, uh, throwing stones, throwing um, inflammable um, uh, projectiles really destroyed this castle easily. And we could say that Olesko Castle is probably one of the first fully stone castles in the territory of Ukraine. And in fact, probably the oldest one, which is still in inhabitable condition. So um, surely this castle uh, was rebuilt through generations of owners, through different historical periods. But the hill is so small and steep that this castle never walked out from its original uh, circle of the walls. And um, still, if you look on this map, uh, on this picture, you will see that the ground floor, the uh, lower line of the castle, which uh, built from the like a row of stones, uh, goes back to early 14th century. Then uh, the situation changed and uh, our land lost its independence. In the 14th century, uh, last king of Ukraine died and his closest relative became king of Poland. And in fact, the Oleska castle was the last castle uh, which was protected by Ukrainian uh, landlords from the Polish invasion. Uh, and when Poland magnified its territory uh, in a huge uh, uh, amount of new lands, they understand the need to rule those lands. So uh, lots of castles preserve, preserve the same owners. They just change their loyalty to a new king and they preserve their titles and territories. So Olesko Castle was owned by Ivashko Pereslusic, the man who changed the king, over served his first ruler and served another. And then in the uh, 14th, 15th century, this castle is mentioned in documents of Vatican when Roman Pope make a gift, a few castles, including Olesko, to a Lviv bishop. It doesn't mean that the bishop physically live in the castle, it means that um, all the um, uh, taxes gathered um, from the local territory to the purse of the Olesko castle go to the, the purse of the bishop. So it was a very good gift. And um, you must understand that this castle is standing on the one of the main roads of Western Ukraine. We used to call this road from Vikings to Greeks or from Kiev to Hungary. So uh, it was only one uh, narrow pass between huge Volinian swamps and uh, steep hills covered by dense forest where it was impossible to pass by a trading caravan. And uh, Olesko served as a customs uh, trading post. So now you look on the inner courtyard, and uh, this is a view from the castle main gates to the far wall of the courtyard. And this wall is, uh, in fact, the oldest preserved wall of the castle. Once such battle gallery surrounded all castle uh, by a perimeter, and only a tower, the watchtower, was higher. But when new floors was added, when new uh, living quarters was added, uh, probably the owners preserved this part of battle gallery uh, for the purpose when enemies managed to break the main gates they could achieve a salvo of uh, musket fire in their faces so in such a way this battle gallery will work not only from for outside protection but in even in inside protection and through this inner court here you can get to pretty much any meaningful um, room uh, in this castle on the left side there's a huge well uh, nearly 60 meters deep, uh, and uh, this well provides a uh, castle constantly by water supply. On the right side, there is entrance to the kitchen, uh, which always was separated from the living quarters, so the stench of um, onion and uh, baked uh, food won't be a problem for the nobles, so only prepared food was bringing to their dining halls. Um, and uh, in the very beginning, the castle served more like a military uh, fortress then as a residence of the uh, landlord. So on the next photo, we would see a model of a castle in the very beginning of its uh, uh, built history. 
Uh, this model is situated in a former arsenal, uh, now litigated uh, as a whole of a castle history. And you can see that the first line of defense um, for this castle was marshlands. And the second line was artificially made like a, a circle of the artificial hill reinforced by a wooden palisade. And finally, on the top of the hill was a keep as a castle fortress. And in that time, uh, it includes only a barracks on the left side, small arsenal on the right, and the tower was a drawbridge. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, when drawbridge was raised, uh, even to get to the walls with your ram was hard. So castle was really hard to get, but because it was standing uh, as the only one solitary fortress on a very meaningful trading road, usually it was taken um, by the enemies, no matter how many warriors they need to spam, they need to put their heads down attacking the fortress. So in the um, end of the 14th, early 15th century, for this castle was a huge war between Polish King Jagajlo and his brother Svidrugajlo, who made a riot. So Poland and Lithuania was fighting for this castle. And finally, Polish knight John Seminski won this castle for the Polish king, achieved it as a prize. He was still calling himself Seninski, but his children were already calling themselves Oleski. Then this castle became a dowry, divided with, between two noble families, Herburt and uh, Zulkiewski. And both of these families had their own family nests. So this castle really served as a military fortress. And finally, when both of this family die through ages uh, on the battlefield, the castle in the early 17th century become a property of Ivan Danilovich. He was a Palatine Terra Russia, or warlord of all Rusin lands, means the territory of Ukraine under the Polish reign. And he was, in fact, representative of the Polish king on the Cossack uh, siege in the Cossack army. Uh, well, and he was Ukrainian, the, probably in at that time one of the most richest Ukrainian nobles. Uh, he managed to marry his daughter, Teofilia, with a um, warlord of Krakow Castle, Castellan of Krakow. Uh, and uh, Jacob Sobeski and his wife was traveling uh, along the road near the castle when a huge storm started. And the wife was on the last months of her pregnancy, so they decided to spend the night uh, in this castle hiding from the storm. And here in this uh, tower, in a room of the um, Castellane, on a black marble table, John Sebeski was born under thunder and lighting, uh, thunderstorm behind the window. Uh, legend said that when a uh, mother uh, bring the child to this world, uh, the lightning strikes, the thunder ro roars, and the black marble table cracked. It was a symbol that the great warrior coming to this world. Uh, and then, second time, John Sobeski visited castle where he was born when he was already elected king of Poland in his 45 years old with his beautiful and beloved wife. Um, and uh, when they saw this castle previously ruined by Tatar invasion, the wife said, looking on the ruin from, uh, from far, he was born here. Oh, it looks so nice. Can I give this castle to me? So this castle became a gift to a queen of Poland and rebuild it in a early Baroque style. And in this style, this castle uh, comes to nowadays. Today, this castle is the property of the Lviv National Gallery of Art as a, one of the branches of this huge gallery, was one of the biggest collection of art inside. It's a, one of the most interesting museums of the castle interiors in Ukraine and here, on this picture, you can see some of the examples of the castle uh, sculpture collection. On the left, there is a Mother Mary sculpture that goes back to 14th century. It's a late Gothic sculptures made of wood for probably a uh, castle chapel or some local small wooden church. And for um, Ukrainian post-Soviet territory, where lots of churches was destroyed during the Soviet period, such old and uh, sculptures uh, of uh, sacred uh, meaning is extremely rare and precious. Uh, on the right side, you will see um, one of the Baroque sculptures about which we will speak a bit later in the store. And in the center, there is uh, one of the most interesting uh, sculpture. This is a bust of the, one of the most beautiful ladies 
of the uh, Lithuanian kingdom. As usually guys joke, uh, she was Miss Lithuania 16th century. Uh, her name was Barbara Radzivil. And she was uh, from one of the most richest families of Lithuania and one of the best uh, brides in that time in all Polish Lithuanian territories. So the king of Poland was dreaming to marry her, but he officially couldn't because she was not a princess. King should marry was a princess from other noble family from other country. Uh, she was lower in a feudal grade uh, than the king. But king wanted mother of a king, mother queen, Bona Sforza from Italian dynasty was against this marriage. All court was against this marriage, but king decided and bring this lady into the royal palace. She was beautiful, kind, young, and suddenly she become very sick and she died. So the rumors in the court said that mother queen um, poisoned her. It was a big drama. Even there was a, a Polish uh, play uh, made in 19th century, Death of Barbara Radzivill. We usually can see it in the Polish opera house. Well, in the 20th century, scientists discovered her remnants and studied them, and they proved that she died probably from cancer. But in her remnants, they found it, uh, traces of arsenic. So probably she was healed in that alchemical uh, system of medicine. And what killed first, disease or medicine? Well, who knows? But today, scientists say that this is one of the best, uh, the most precise sculpture of this lady preserved in uh, probably our territories. Well, going next to the next picture, it's another one, a sculpture. In fact, it's a so-called tomb Venus, as we call them, or tombstone of Anna Efrosinia Sinyavska. She was a lady of a Berezhani castle, and she died in the 16th century in her age of 29. Well, um, her beautiful uh, tombstone made of alabaster was in fact, like a uh, lid covering her sarcophagus. And in that time, uh, people uh, of her family can come and uh, sp speak with her, uh, understand how she looked during her life and think how she is resting now in heaven waiting for the last judgment. And uh, such sculptures in, uh, made in that time, there was very, por uh, very uh, detailed in a portrait um, meaning. And uh, uh, today, this is a great source for understanding of the uh, fashion of that time for some accessories of some dresses. Also, such sculptures bears lots of secret meanings. You can see that this lady bears the uh, book in her hand. It means that book of her life is ended and her diary will never be added. And also it could be a meaning that she was uh, very educated. She knew how to read. Usually if a man on such tombstone was shown with a hourglass in his hand, it means he died because his time uh, just ended. It means he died in his bed. Or if it was a knight with a sword in his arm shown, it means he, he died in battle. And usually in such sculptures, you will find a dog near the legs, which uh, symbolize that this man or this lady was loyal to a king or to a husband. Going uh, next, uh, you will find a beautiful, in the same hall, you will find a beautiful collection of icons. Well, the territory of Ukraine uh, was baptized by the Greek uh, ambassadors, by the Greek baptizers, and our local tradition of Christianity goes back to Greece, so it's Greek Orthodox. And um, in that time, icons become a Bible in pictures. In fact, sometimes they was looking like a comics to explain the believers uh, about their creed. Sometimes a uh, Bible could be only one for all village and only one priest in a village would know how to read the Bible. So people visiting church will understand what the preacher uh, tells uh, in the pictures on the walls. But it's not just a picture. The Greek icon uh, is a picture made by a very strict canon. It should be painted in proper colors, in proper shape, or else the bishop won't bless this icon. Uh, and the... Uh, I can should have writings near Nimbus, which explain what saint you're looking now, uh, or what uh, event is shown. 
So it's really a, a big science behind such uh, icons. And it's very interesting to uh, study and discover the secrets behind them. And, uh, you know, we preserve a lot of them. So usually passing by a collection of icons in Ukrainian museums, even local people uh, usually won't think um, how precious they are. For example, the icon on the left goes back to 15th century. So this icon already has more than 600 years. And in that time, uh, to paint such icon, you need to be not just a painter, you need to be an alchemist. There were no shop with paint in that time. You need to uh, mix some powders, usually bought from the caravan from the Far East, uh, to mix some powder of um, cobalt oxide with uh, uh, egg or with um, wine to achieve a tempera paint. And then you need to put it very fast on the deck because this paint would dry very fast and you will lose the precious material. It's not an oil paint which dry for a few days and you can easily um, uh, uh, fix your mistake. Yeah? So, it's, so you need already to have all conception, all the picture in your mind and be very skillful to paint. And this thing really um, was made by a long school of study and sharing the knowledge and skill. And here on the right, you would see a very interesting um, uh, picture, very interesting icon, which is uh, only one uncanonic icon. So it means each paint, uh, painter, each icon painter could make his own version of such icon. Usually you will see this icon when you turn already your back to the altar and go out of the church. So on other, for, uh, in a um, inner wall of a nave near the entrance, you would see the last judgment, which reminds you how you should live in this world. So you will be judged properly in, um, and achieve the great life in your afterlife. Yeah. So you can see on this beautiful icon made on a cypress deck, uh, like a triptych in the three parts, on the top, the angels are rolling up the skies. It's the end of the world. And all saints, all angels, all heavenly forces are gathered around Holy Trinity. And Jesus, as a king of this world, is sitting on a throne. And God's hands is carrying the uh, scales in which each of us will be uh, weighted and measured. Joseph will put the good deeds of our life on the scales and Mary will put uh, uh, sins. And you can see a small uh, demon from hell is sitting on the scales to put down sins and put the soul in the hell. So on the right side, you will see the beds are raising from the grave. That's why in our territory was prohibited to burn bodies, only buried in the soil. So they will rise for the last judgment. From the, last, uh, from the right side of Jesus, you can find uh, good people, righteous people, uh, Orthodox Christians, king of Orthodox countries, priests, uh, monks from the uh, Orthodox monasteries, hermits. And on the left side, you would see the sinners. And mostly it's infidel nations. You can see here Turks, Tatars, Jews, Arabs, uh, Moors from Africa, and even Catholics. Sorry, guys, if I offend somebody, this is a picture from the 15th, 16th century. And um, in that time, Orthodox painter put a Catholics as a schismatics uh, to the sinner side, yeah, because Catholics was uh, occupying Ukrainian Orthodox lands and terrorizing the villagers. So everywhere they was sinners. And on the lower side, you can see the sinners uh, suffering in uh, heaven. There is a lot of beautiful and interesting details there. And uh, by the right side, you can see a fortress of God, the heaven, and even garden inside. Okay, uh, going next, uh, we will see a fireplace hall. Sorry, there is no fireplace in this um, picture. It's on the right. It's the biggest hall of this castle. And uh, it's only one hall in a castle which preserves some uh, stucco decoration on the walls. The drama of Olesko Castle was that when Polish king John Sobeski died, his son sell the castle to neighbors and they uh, totally sell all the furniture, all the pictures, all the art collection from this castle from auction because they needed money. And for the very long period, the castle was empty till Austrian Empire bought it. And uh, the Austrian government turned it into a school for ladies. 
But then during the Soviet period, it was school of the uh, collective farm engineers, uh, mechanizers. And then in 1950s, somebody stole the lightning rod from the roof. The roof was made of wood and uh, lightning after a few months destroyed castle totally. It was burned uh, through. And for nearly 20 years, this castle was standing as an empty shell, no roof, no ceiling. So very few inner decorations was preserved by fire. And only in 1975, this castle was renovated as a first uh, castle museum on an Ukrainian territory. And uh, uh, students and uh, professors of Lviv Gallery of Art, Lviv uh, Academy of Art, was working to renovate the castle. And uh, by the elements found it on the wall, they tried to restore the former interior. So uh, here you can see on the right side the portrait of Ivan Danilovich, the Ukrainian owner of this castle in the uh, early 17th century, and two beautiful Baroque sculptures. Well, in fact, these sculptures look like a marble, uh, but they was made of wood from the linden wood or lime, honey lime wood. This is a soft wood, easy to carve, and usually in a Baroque time in the 17th century, they was made or for the church uh, interiors, for the altars, um, or as these two particular sculptures, they was made to demonstrate the virtues of a dead man of a very uh, noble family. This one particularly was made for a death of the Polish prince. And uh, they was uh, usually standing near the coffin in uh, the burial ceremony in the church or in the palace. And then after ceremony was ended, usually uh, people will burn such sculptures as an element of the uh, burial ceremony. They don't like to preserve such things, but this uh, too was made so nicely. Well, in fact, there was much more than two of them. There was, uh, I believe, eight sculptures, and some of them are preserved in the Lviv Museum, some of them are here. Well, uh, they was made so nicely that just people could not destroy them, so they was preserved. Um, in that time, castle uh, was very hard to warm during the winters. So all sleeping rooms are situated on third floor, which have much more lower ceiling and you need to, uh, literally to warm much smaller space. But in that time, uh, if you want to rest, usually people uh, make the uh, sleeping place in an alcove, which could be covered by um, heavy drapers. And in such a way, the uh, air inside will be much more warmer than the big hall. And on this picture, you can see a beautiful uh, furniture made in Lviv by Armenian masters in the 16th century in a Renaissance style. This uh, bed is made for one person because in that time, even husband and wife would usually sleep in different bedrooms. They will lie on one bed only to make a child. Uh, and um, this bed is covered by the bolohin, by such covering, which could be covered by drapers inside, again, to preserve the warm air. And usually such beautifully decorated carved beds and uh, uh, chairs, uh, etc. they will be made by a dynasty of the woodcarvers. The grandfather will um, be teaching his um, son and will be preserving wood, drying it for the future work. His son will carve and his grandson will sell and study. And from generation to generation, such business was working. Now moving next, this hall is decorated in already new Baroque style, late 16th, early 17th century. Uh, the French uh, fashion comes to our lands. In fact, Poland and France always was a big friend. They was exchanging princes. Uh, Maria Lyszynska, Polish lady, become a queen of France, uh, wife of uh, one of the French kings. And uh, this Olesko castle was a palace of a queen of Poland who was a French lady. Well, and um, in uh, the 17th century, the fake it space painting in a French language called Grisail become very fashionable. All these drapers on the walls, as you can see, they are painted, but they look like they really, uh, the walls are decorated by uh, lavish fabric and uh, like there is no wall and you can see through the wall deep into some um, uh, beautiful landscape. 
and uh, the vase over the table is also painted, but painted with such uh, uh, adding of shadows that uh, from the far you can believe that there is a real um, vase with flowers on the wall. But the most interesting, it's the picture over the portal, one of the few original preserved 16th century portals of this castle. And um, over you can see two angels fighting and third is standing nearby with a crown for the winner, a victor, for the victor. Um, people say that this is like two exemplars of love, love by uh, calculation, uh, love uh, to a lady, not because she's beautiful, but because she's rich and uh, really uh, amour, the love from the heart, from the soul. And they are fighting in our mind, who will win? Um, in fact, this is a picture made in shades of gray, but if you look on it, standing in this hall, you will really believe that this is bas relief. And only when you come nearby and look on the side, you will see that this is a flat picture. So in that time, such 3D without any extra glasses was really uh, very fashionable and funny. Well, and this is the uh, room in the tower, the hall in the tower. So probably in this hall, the future king of Poland, John Sobeski, was born. And also look please on the thickness of the walls in the windows, how uh, thick they are, how strong this castle was to stop the enemy cannonballs. Well, in the next room you will see another one collection of sacred art. And uh, you really could not imagine how difficult it was to make such sculpture in a Soviet time in the 70s, where religion was generally prohibited. In the Ukrainian territory, uh, two branches of Christianity was finding each other, was meeting and sometimes competing or sometimes uh, cooperating. Because Ukrainians generally uh, was uh, baptized in the Orthodox tradition, but our Polish rulers was Catholics. So on the right side, you will see iconostasis, which is literally like a um, description of your creed. This thing, this wall of icons will divide altar from the nave. And here you would see in the lower line, small icons, which shows you the 12 main church celebrations through the year. So it's a calendar. Then you will see 12 apostles and Jesus as a king of this world sitting on the throne. Then in this circle medallions, the Old Testament prophets. Some church can afford another one row of icons with the passions of Christ. So literally everything you need to know about your creed is decorated, put it on this wall. On the left side, it's an enormously beautiful and lavish Catholic uh, altar from the castle chapel. Beautifully made, beautifully decorated, made of wood and uh, covered by rich colors. Well, going next, uh, we will see the pearl of uh, our collection in this castle. It's a battle painting describing a battle near Vienna in 1683. Probably the biggest battle in uh, Europe in that century. And probably this was a battle which really uh, defined the fate of Europe. Well, this picture is enormous. It was made not for this particular castle. It was made for a church in the city of Zsolkiv or Zdovkva where the warlords of Poland was buried and uh, in the huge inner hall of the temple on the walls of the church you will see a four huge battle pictures uh, showing you the greatest victories of the Polish armies. And uh, just imagine this picture has seven meters, uh, seven and something meters tall, so it's like more than 24 feet tall and uh, like six meters uh, uh, wide. It was so big that in any castle of the time, there were no room to fit. And to show this picture in Olesko Castle, we need to dismantle a ceiling on the third floor and stretch this uh, picture on a very specific um, uh, frame. Well, Martino Altamonte, the master, um, the court master of a Polish king, needed 10 years to make two such battle pictures. And the second we'll see in the next castle. So this, battle took place near the capital of Austria, near Vienna. Ottoman Empire in that time decided finally to turn Europe into a uh, Muslim caliphate. So they gathered probably the biggest army Europe ever saw in that time. Different historical still as different numbers, but it was approximately uh, 
300,000 warriors and they siege Vienna by a camp bigger than the Vienna herself. And the Polish king, John Sebeski, managed together with Polish army, Ukrainian Cossacks, some Italian and German uh, regiments, uh, army twice smaller. He was afraid to attack, but during uh, the siege, one of the citizens of Vienna, who in fact was Ukrainian uh, from the Lviv neighborhood, um, come as a spy knowing Turkish language through all this camp and bring to John Sobeski the very meaningful intelligence. So next day, the Polish army attack and cut Turks from supply, literally attack from unpredicted uh, direction and strike in the back of a Turkish camp, cutting them from the artillery, from their supplies. So all Turkish army ran away and finally lost this war in the next battle. So you can see the culmination of this battle. On the left side, the Polish army led in the battle by uh, King John Sobeski is like an avalanche moving out the Turks away. And on the right side, Turks are retreating uh, and throwing their weapons, running in fear. Um, you can see the beautiful girls on the camels from the Turkish harem um, uh, evacuated. And in the center of the picture, the huge uh, red tent of the warlord is now already robbed and Turk even killing an ostrich. Because in this huge camp was not just a food for uh, soldiers, cannons and supplies, it was a movable city to show the greatness of a Muslim tradition to infidels. So they even bring a small zoo with African animals with them. And uh, in the face of the Polish army, you can see the Polish King John Sobeski with his young son, 16 years old, in an antique uh, helmet looking like um, a young Alexander uh, attacking uh, the enemy forces. And King himself is leading the army, but dressed like a Roman Caesar in a triumphant uh, antique armor, stepping by his horseshoes on the Turkish general. And this battle was won by um, Polish winged hussars, fam famous um, cavalry of the 17th century, decorated by the leopardus uh, leather and uh, with a long spears and two pistols. And um, also in this battle, we know there was lots of Ukrainian Cossacks. And funny that in the very center of this picture, you will find yellow and blue banner as uh, still a symbol of Ukrainian country. Well, maybe in that time, it was also used by Ukrainian forces. Going to the next picture, we see the portraits of owners of our castle. This is John Sobeski III, elected King of Poland. He was a warlord and in Polish Republic, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, the kings was elected as first among equal. So this man literally spent all his life in battles um, and uh, protects our lands from Turkish and Tatar invasions from Crimea constantly. So for his victories, he was elected as a king. And uh, he was the last king uh, who was leading his army into the battle. All next Polish kings was only controlling their armies from, from far from hill. And his beautiful wife, Maria Casimira Lagrange d'Arquin from the French uh, noble family. There was rumors that she could be even a bastard uh, daughter of a, a French king. The story of their love is really astonishing. You can write books about the this couple. Uh, she was a wife of other Polish noble. They met on the ball and fell in love from the first sight. In that time, it was nearly impossible to achieve divorce. So they was waiting each other, uh, one, uh, waiting each other uh, for seven years. That this lady, for her life, born 16 children. Few of them uh, pity, uh, survived the young diseases. And she overlived two of her husbands. And uh, she ended her life in uh, the castle in Blois in France. She managed to marry her granddaughter with old pretender Stuart. And her son became Bonnie Prince Charlie, the pre young pretender on the English throne. Such dynastical um, uh, connections was uh, in European noble families. So, this really was a very uh, gentle love between these two persons. There was even a book of their uh, love letters to each other. So for the Poland, uh, this is a big story of romance and loyalty of husband and his wife. 
And going next, it's a collection of Baroque art preserved by Boris Wozniewski, the director of our gallery of art. This art is now moved into Lviv, into Museum of George John Pinzel, and in our Lesko Castle is a bit different exhibition already made. Such figures was greatest achievement of sacred art in the 17th century. Europe survived few big wars and pestilences, the plague uh, disease, and the art decided to show to the visitors of the church that the man is already not just a pile of sins, it's more like a best creation of God going from sin to sanity, moving. So they decide to show a passion and life in the um, fixa uh, fixated sculptures. And they try to show a movement, a passion. All look on these beautiful drapers uh, in a geometrical shape. And this figure was made by John George Pinzel, one of the best sculptors of the 17th, 18th century working on our territory. Pity that such sculptures was destroyed mostly during the Soviet time. When this sculptures was thrown away from the altar, sometimes from 10, 50 meters uh, height, uh, they fall down and the most fragile things, the hands, the faces was lost. Now this wooden sculpture is uh, renovating and preserved in the Lviv Museum. Go in next. Uh, well, this is the end of a museum in Olesko and nearby the castle, you can see a huge monastery and church of Capucin monks. It was built here in the 17th century to protect the souls of the people and their bodies, because it was also a fortress where half of the Olesko village could hide and shoot back to enemies. This monastery still has a shooting holes. And now, well, since the Soviet times, monks doesn't live here anymore. Today, the cells of the monastery are turned to laboratories where our renovators restore the old art. And in the church, there is a huge warehouse with a beautiful collection of uh, art, uh, still belongs to gallery of art, but there is no literally shelves to show them. Usually from such warehouse, we make some temporal exhibitions. Well, we will drive next along the road and uh, from the tower of Olesko Castle, uh, you will see the tower of a next one, the castle in Bidhirci or Podhorce. So let's drop the last uh, look on the castle in Olesko, surrounded by a huge, beautiful park uh, with a main alley on the left and pond on the right, and a castle standing on the stupe hill and a monastery on the you know, foothill. And going to Bidhirci or Podhorce. Well, uh, there is a seven kilometers between two castles and Pidhirci is literally standing on that former great Plisnesko city, which was destroyed by the Mongols. But for the very long period, this castle was totally wooden and only in the late 16th century it was rebuilt. In fact, the owner invited the, one of the best uh, French engineers, Guillaume Levasseur de Beauplan, to rebuild this castle. And to the old stone fortress, he added uh, bastions in a neo-Holland or neo-Dutch bastion fortification. But already in that time, Pidhorecki Castle was nicknamed Toy Castle. From the three main destinations, it was protected by much more stronger fortresses, by fortress in Brody, by fortress in Zolochiv, and by Olesko Castle. So enemies rarely can manage to get to the walls of this one. And uh, for all history of this castle, it was attacked and taken by enemies only twice, by uh, Tatars and by the Zaporizhia and Cossacks during the Ukrainian uh, riot against the Polish king. So um, usually they nickname this castle uh, a place where Mars is resting with Venus, or in the language of the Renaissance people, a place where the general will rest after his military campaign with his beloved wife. Um, and such type of a castle we call here Palazzo Cum Castello or Palace on the Castle. And the palace you're looking now uh, was built by Andrea del Aqua, invited uh, military engineer uh, from the Florence, from the Florentine Republic. This Renaissance master made beautiful palace and as a castle, maybe this uh, castle is not so big, but as a palace, is one of the 10 biggest palaces of continental Europe still preserved um, in uh, shape. And uh, well, you can now look on the courtyard of a castle where the visitors will come, uh, left their carriages and go over the steps uh, to rest. The castle is decorated in a Polish Renaissance style or uh, as we call it, 
a Sarmatian style. This is a military style because Polish warlords literally call themselves Schlachtich or warriors. Uh, so on this balcony, you can see in a decoration, swords, helmets, cuirasses, um, halberds, pistols, uh, bows and arrows, all military symbols and plenty of faces of lions as a symbol of royal um, power. And the main palace uh, bears three towers. In a central tower was a cross on the top, used to be a chapel. And look on those beautiful crowns on the chimneys. And on the both sides, there is a Baroque uh, tower, towers. Uh, and on each of them, you can find sculpture of Atlas. One buries the uh, model of the astronomical sphere, and other buries the huge uh, golden globe, which is a sun and symbol of richness. Yeah. The owners of this castle uh, was Stanislav Konitz Polski, one of the most famous Polish warlords of the uh, early 17th century. Then it was bought by John Sobieski, King of Poland, and all nobles of uh, neighboring countries was dreaming to visit a ball in this palace. It was surrounded by three huge park in a French style, in Italian style, and in a shape of English maze. So you can spend here a beautiful weekend, find some interesting people. Then in the late 17th century, this castle was bought by family of Zhivuski, and for the four generations, this castle belonged to them. They turned the castle into the Museum of Art, and inside you can see the old um, pictures and photos of former interiors. Pity, but today we can only speak about them looking on old pictures. Inside castle, again, is totally empty. When Soviets was uh, invading the Western Ukraine, the last owner from Sangushko family managed to put biggest part of this collection on the trucks and bring them to Romanian port of Constanza, from where he traveled by a steamer to San Paulo in Brazil in exile. And still, in that city, you will find a foundation of Sangushko with a beautiful collection from Podgorzy Castle. But neither Poland nor Ukraine doesn't have this collection now. And the Soviets turned this palace into sanatorium for tuberculosis people, uh, sick of tuberculosis. Well, and again, and again, in the middle of 50s, it was destroyed by a huge fire. Uh, so after the fire in 1959, this castle was rebuilt, but inside it was just painted in white and only marble beautiful portals over the doors are preserved in some of the fireplaces. All this beautiful decoration is preserved only on the pictures. Next one, you can see an old former black and white pictures from the made in the uh, interbellum period before the second world war. And you can see that literally on the walls of this castle was no empty place to put a new picture. They put them frame to frame and even installed them into a ceilings. This castle was so rich uh, and beautiful that each room of the castle was dedicated to some uh, uh, style of art or some country. There was a Chinese room decorated by a Chinese silk on the walls. There was a Turkish hall. There was hall of Venetian mirrors. Look on this beautiful enfilade uh, of the rooms and doors and uh, beautiful stoves chandeliers. Uh, well, pity that all this collection was nearly gone. Half of this collection was moved to Lviv museums and you can find some pictures from uh, this collection of art either in Alaska or in Zolochev Castle or in museums of Lviv. Going next, we'll see a view from the bastions and the castle is standing on the hill but the name of the village Podhorci or Pidhirci means that this is a village on the hill, on the foothill. But the castle was built on the top to protect the village on the foothill. So a bit dissonance. The name of the castle means under hill, but it stays on the hill. Well, in fact, the difference of heights from the hill and lowlands are more than 100 meters. And in a good weather, you can see a beautiful valley in front of you. This is a, a view on the north, on the Valenian swamps. And um, before... Uh, Khrushchev, the Soviet Union secretary, made a huge melioration. All this that it was merely um, impossible to pass. In fact, the next uh, settlement uh, to the Kiev by the road has a name Brody, means fords. Only one place where you can 
passed through the swamps. And nearby this castle was only one um, available road to Lviv, so you can easily control all the trading uh, going through this road. And now it's a spectacular view for um, marriage ceremonies, for the different corporate parties, and sometimes we use this castle as a place of some events. And in front of a castle, uh, usually where all tourist buses are stopping, you can see not just a church. The owner of the castle was a very pious man. During his um, um, life, he made lots of sins. He was a card player and usually was in debts and he needed lots of money. He married a much more younger lady only for her dowry. And once, when he returned back from the hunt, he founded her uh, with a young, beautiful groom. So the groom was hanged and the lady was kept in a tower uh, as a prisoner. So she will be more polite and modest wife. And then legend said that when courier visited the castle and asked the um, owner to visit Lviv, because King is calling him, uh, he said, you will spend maybe five years in, uh, five days, I'm sorry, in uh, the road and go back and in Lviv. So the owner of the castle gave occasion to all his um, workers and said to nobody that wife is still in a tower. Lady died from hunger. And since that time, since the early 18th century, she is the most famous ghost on the Western Ukraine. There's lots of legends, lots of people visiting this castle through the last 20, uh, 200 years, doesn't knowing each other, doesn't never conversating with each other, describe meeting with her in a castle corridor pretty much in the same way. Um, well, the white lady of Podhorci is a famous ghost. And even uh, if you remember the TV show on Discovery Channel, um, a few years ago, it took place, uh, International Ghost Hunters. Uh, in a second season, you will find a series about Pilgirci Castle. So you can download it from internet and um, uh, look more about the castle. And the owner from the Zaluski family understand that in the last days of his life, he will probably won't get to heaven. So he decided to buy a ticket to heaven and he started to build churches, monasteries. So he become a famous donator. And around this church and in scripts, all family of Zaluski was buried. So it was both a tomb, a crypt, and the church uh, for the castle, uh, city, uh, uh, castle owners. In fact, this is a smallified copy of uh, St. Peter's Cathedral from Rome. And on the facade of this cathedral, on the facade of this church, you can read in cultum domini, the uh, nostri exodus, in cult of God, in beliefs of God is our exodus. Only one thing I can say about preservation of the church. During the Soviet time, when the castle became a um, hospital, in this church was a workshop to repair tractors for village. Yep, it was badly damaged by people ignorance. And um, there was a still holes from the bullets from the Second World War in the walls of the church. And now, already 10 years, the church is renovated and uh, liturgies are still going and local people can pray again in this temple. So we next. And the last castle we visit today will be castle in Zoluchiv. Zoluchiv, uh, the name of this settlement uh, goes to Zola in Ukrainian language means uh, cinder or ash. And there was a lots of craftsmen around working. Uh, the coalers was making a wood coal. So after they worked, there was lots of cinder. So local cinderellas and uh, well, our local craftsmen was working with a cinder, turning it into fertilizer, into soap, and into a dark gray black pigment for uh, for painting the uh, painting the fabrics, the canvas, the dresses, yeah, etc. So it was very meaningful uh, craft uh, post on the roads from uh, east to west. This road was uh, called in Poland Via Regia, the road of the kings, or it was in fact a part of a great silk road through all Ukraine from east to west. And Zoloshiv was a trading post on this road. So it was so rich settlement that in the um, uh, 15th century it uh, achieved a Magdeburg rights. So it became an independent city, uh, loyal only to a king, paying taxes only to a king, not to uh, local nobles. But local nobles still bears the castle nearby. And um, uh, they was originally from Ukrainian dynasty of Sebastian or Sobko. They 
change the pronunciation of the family name into Sobieski. And uh, Martin Sobieski, uh, warlord of Lublin, uh, decided to rebuild Old Castle into a neo-Holland bastion architecture. We call such forts, such fortresses, a star fort, fortress star. This dagger-shaped bastions on each point of the fortress allow you to make a flanking fire. So there were no empty spot, no blind spot near the wall. And this castle was already made for artillery war. The walls are made of soil and only reinforced by the stones outside. And uh, on each bastion and on each curtain wall, there was uh, eight cannons. So in this castle, you can count 64 main cannons of the main caliber. Well, in that time, it was a battery of a battleship and not many um, European kings can allow to, can afford to uh, gather so big amount of artillery in one post. So this is one of the strongest fortresses of the eastern border of Poland. And um, the fifth bastion in front of a gate was called Ravelin. Uh, so enemies first need to get to Ravelin, then they will see another one moat, another one drawbridge. So to get into this castle was really very hard. Well, in the 17th century, in the early 18th century, the inner courtyard of a castle was turned uh, from the barracks into a French park like in Versailles. And now slowly we restore the park. So we can see the um, entrance tower, like a structure near entrance. On the right side, there is a huge castle palace, more looking like a bunker, thick walls, um, strong uh, roof, but inside, this was really a palace, very comfortable, and small and fancy Chinese palace on the courtyard. Well, uh, and uh, here you can see a mystical stones, one of the most interesting um, uh, thing from the collection uh, of the castle. Well, in fact, we found the stones not in the castle. It was, they was founded in the forest in a neighboring village in early 2000 and bring to a castle. Well, local people always know about them. And as you can see on this stones, somebody make very beautiful and precise font, but the words miss some letters. So this is a charade and nobody still really can, uh, are, uh, was able to read the text. We, does, we doesn't know who made these stones and for what purpose. Maybe there is a version that in the 18th or 19th century when medieval um, histories become very popular through the uh, night novels, chivalry novels, um, some uh, owner of a neighboring palace makes such things for his daughter. There is a version that uh, secret society, maybe the Freemasons make this sculpture, these stones with some secret only for those people who will be able, who will be enlightened enough, able to read. Maybe they use this stone in the um, initiation ceremonies. On the left stone, you can see a merge of two uh, crowns of thorns and roses, of spikes and flowers, which shows you the uh, sins and virtues or uh, suffering in this life and the uh, virtues of the afterlife. And the hole between them uh, probably bears the cross once. So this is a symbol going to the Rose and Cross uh, Society, like Freemason Society. Maybe uh, owners of this castle was part of a secret order. Other versions said that these stones could be made in a time when Gothic font was um, available, only one font in uh, writings, and it was 13th century, so probably they was made by Templar knights. It's not a joke. On the territory of Ukraine, we used to have two Templar fortresses, and uh, maybe these stones bear the secret of the treasures, because on the third small stone in the center, there is no writings, but there is an arrow made in stone. And who knows, maybe on this main rock is written, two steps on the left from curvy pine and dig, but nobody really knows. And uh, maybe this mystery still could be solved. And now we're looking at a Chinese palace. That means Chinese palace. You must understand that for the time uh, of the 16th, 17th century, China for Europeans still was like other planets. And art of China was so beautiful that, you know, uh, people was jealous. Uh, we were thinking, we Europeans wear a heavy cloth of wool and Chinese people wear the uh, 
silk dress, soft and light as a feather. Uh, we Europeans eat from the ceramical plates and they eat from the beautiful porcelain. So rich people try to buy some collection of Chinese uh, souvenirs bring by the travelers from East and decorate merely a room in their palace. And only the richest people, richest nobles, kings can afford to have a palace, like a pavilion, not for living, but for spending time to drink some Chinese tea with his friends and show them their richness. And uh, such palaces today could be found only in three places in Europe, in Lomonosovo near St. Petersburg, belonged to Russian emperors, near Berlin in Potsdam, in Palace of St. Susi, belonged to Friedrich the Great, and here in Zolotiv in Ukraine, you know, for Europeans, sometimes we could say in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but this shows you how rich was this country in the 17th century. And today in this palace, there is a collection of Eastern art. But pity, there is a tradition in this museum that inside this uh, palace, it's prohibited to take photos. Only look, but don't take pictures, please. So we won't speak today about the collection of Eastern art, not only China, that you can find them. Some, uh, there are some Indian, some Egyptian things, some uh, um, Japanese stuff, some uh, Arabic East. And now we move to the main castle hall. Oh, it's really beautiful. And just imagine, the story of this palace is a story of renovation in early 2000s. During the Soviet time, this castle suffered a lot. First, Austrian Empire turned it into a jail and interior was better damaged. Then Polish people preserved here Ukrainian patriots. And then when the Soviets invaded in 1939, they used this castle as a jail for unwelcome elements or those people who never will become a communist, priests, officers of First World War, who can lead people, um, young lawyers, doctors. So elite of Ukrainian nation. When Nazis attacked the Soviets in 41, the Soviet army was retreating without any shot back to enemies. They were just running to Dnieper River and they literally have no transport enough to move the prisoners. So 649 people was killed without any trial for two hours in this castle. Well, Nazi doesn't bring anything good to the castle. They use it like a jail for, like a POV, like a camp for prisoners of war, mostly deserters from the German army, Hungarians, Romanians, Italians. And then uh, it was turned into a concentration camps for Jews and 12,000 Jews died in this castle. Soviets preserve it as a jail till the middle of 50s and then turn into a technical school. And in 1991, it was given to museum in a shape of ruin. So it was slowly, uh, slow and low, long process to renovate. Now you can see a beautiful uh, fireplace in a Sarmatian Polish style in the 16th century on the left side made. And on the right side, beautiful stove, 19th century made of porcelain. And uh, this castle today looks like a pinacotech, like a typical palace of the 19th century, where you can find both furniture from old grand grandfathers and some modern art of Art Nouveau style. So today, the collection of this art covers from 16 to early 20th century uh, pieces of art, mostly the portraits, pictures, and furniture. And here you can see uh, empire style furniture, um, bed and um, wardrobes and beautiful, um, we call it um, credence, the special um, type of furniture with lots of open shelves to show you a collection of art of owner. You can put lots of porcelain figures there, some figurines, some uh, small pictures, some uh, brass or copper uh, cups. Uh, well, this was uh, a, a way to show a collection of art. And there is a very interesting small wooden door on the left. When this castle was built by a same Andrea del Acqua from Florence, he already make it very comfortable. And one traveler in the 17th century described in his journal, it's not really polite to speak about such things, but I could not be silent. In this castle, I found six toilets. Just imagine at that time in Versailles, French king will sit on a pot. And in this castle, there was separately made toilet in a bedroom. 
and on the roof there was a special barrel to gather rainwater and it was a flush. It was extremely comfortable and uh, new technology for the time. Well, so maybe from outside this palace doesn't look like a Disney palace with beautiful uh, turrets and uh, sculptures, but you must understand that it was made for artillery war where cannonballs was flying over and you need to protect yourself inside. The walls have two meters thick, but this castle inside is very warm, lots of fireplaces, very uh, sophisticated system of chimneys in the walls to warm from the lower uh, fireplace, the upper rooms, and six toilets, four for owners and two for servants. And uh, in one of the biggest rooms of the castle, which also has a dismantled ceiling, you will see a second picture, Battle near Parkani. Well, remember that battle near Vienna, Turks retreat. Losing half of their army near Vienna, they still brings a huge amount of soldiers and he was recruiting back to the Turkish lands. Well, and in that time, Turkish lands was already behind Danube. So you can see on this picture, the river Danube, and the Turks found that the bridge is destroyed where they plan to pass. Today, it's a border of Hungary and Slovakia near the city of Estergom. So the Turks made a camp surrounding it by a palisade. You can see it on the left. And in Turkish language, wooden palisade um, called Parkan. Still, in fact, in Ukrainian language, the villager uh, will call his fence, wooden fence around his um, mansion, a Parkan. Still, we use the Turkish word in Ukrainian language. So, John Sobeski was on the shoulder, uh, was on the sh back of this army, and they tried to attack the camp. And King nearly died in a first attack on the pikes of the Turks. So he retreated and decided to wait for artillery. And then they position an artillery and start to shoot, but not to a camp. He was shooting into the bridge Turks was making, uh, making over the river. To make the bridge faster, they just put galley to galley, um, boat to boat, connect them with um, chains and try to pass over. You must understand that in that time people still wear a heavy chain mails and usually they afraid to swim. They never know how to swim. So when Turks understand that artillery fire is going more and more and it's now or never, they start to move over the bridge and Europeans start to shoot into the bridge. And in one moment bridge collapsed. So half of Turkish army was drowned and other half was destroyed. Less than 200 soldiers managed to go on the Turkish side of the river. Among them was a um, great warlord, great vizier, Kara Mustafa Efendi. And when he go back to uh, Istanbul, the uh, Sultan decided to suffocate him in the eyes of his wife and son to punish uh, a general who lost the biggest army Turks ever gathered. Well, in fact, I uh, literally tell you, these two battles decide the fate of Europe. Since that time, Turks never attacked Europe. They only fight with Russians on the Balkans. So it was the last big invasion of Ottomans in the European territory. And John Sobeski, after this battle, achieved a prize from the Roman Pope, the golden sword as a savior of Christianity. Well, you know, today we uh, like to visit a cinema to see uh, some movies about battle in 3D like Dunkirk, um, you know, last of them, to feel yourself on a battlefield. And in that time, such huge pictures will allow you the same uh, experience. Like you are standing literally on the battlefield. On the left side of you, you can see a cannoneer loading the cannon and musketeers are uh, shouting attack and Polish cavalry. And again, uh, Polish King John Sebeski leading his son and his cavalry into the battle. Uh, they are literally uh, putting you into the perspective, into the battle. And again, this picture has more than eight meters tall. Literally, these two battle pictures was the biggest battle paintings in all Europe in the late uh, 17th century. And this is a really a pearls of our collection of gallery of art. Going next, and the last picture we will see today, it's a portrait of Boris Woznitsky. He became a director of our gallery of art during the Soviet time when he was already 50 years old. And he put last 36 years of his life to restore the castles. 
the Soviet Union when they came on these territories. They treat a castle as a nest of a noble uh, oppressing the laborers, uh, villagers. So lots of our castles after the Second World War was literally dismantled and they built barns from the stones of the castles and palaces or turned them to jails, schools, lots of fortresses was damaged or destroyed totally. And only in 1970s, the situation changed in the Soviet culture. They started to treat the castles more like a page of history, which should be preserved and renovated. And Olesko was the first castle literally in Ukraine, rebuild it and turn into museum. And it was a work of Boris Wisnitsky. And he gathered the biggest collection of our art for Ukraine, for Lviv Gallery of Art. You must understand that this was a Soviet collection, it means that we sometimes never know uh, from where uh, was the, um, this piece of art, this furniture, this painting, what was the source, because people was bringing them as the trophies of a Second World War, the soldiers was bringing them from Europe. Uh, Soviet army was robbing the Polish landlord palaces when they was invading, and um, sometimes these things was built, uh, bring to museum. Nobody was cared to just write from which palace it was bring. And then Wisniewski was riding with a truck around Ukrainian, Western Ukrainian villages and telling, I'm buying, we a museum, we are buying old furniture, old pictures, bring, please bring. And sometimes people was bringing real masterpieces. Uh, in fact, in uh, Olesko Castle today, you will find a 16th century hoblin, the tapestry, uh, made in uh, probably in Holland in uh, Renaissance style and this uh, tapestry was bring like a carpet by one lady she told uh, our director that a husband bring this to me from the second world war like a gift for marriage we never know from where so really such was a fate of this uh, collection and Boris Wisniewski really pulled his life put his life on the altar of renovating the castles literally till the end of his life he was visiting uh, all these three castles to look how the renovation process is working and when he was 86 years old seven years ago i believe his heart stopped during uh, just a car drive so he died uh, it was a great loss for us and uh, this man um, was honored by an order hero of ukraine by president yushenko to preserve such big amount of ukrainian culture of ukrainian Art. Well, this will be a last picture from our tour, and uh, I'd uh, like to uh, say thank you for kind audience to be with us with all this tour. And uh, as I told you in the beginning, it was only a teaser for you because this castle really bears a real treasure, and uh, especially for the foreigners, for English speakers, uh, they rarely think about post Soviet territory as a territory of European culture, of European art. But in fact, we always was a part of Europe and we was living in European uh, mentality. We was a um, bridge from East to West and uh, our soldiers, our Cossacks, our Polish nobles, uh, our Ukrainian leaders was always protecting Western Europe from the nomad invasions. They was gathering beautiful trophies from the Eastern art and exchange them for European art, filling their castles with beautiful um, collections of paintings, porcelain, furniture, and all this was uniquely preserved. So it's worse to see, totally worse to see. And um, we wait, you guys in Ukraine, after all this uh, world disease will be ended, after all this COVID quarantine will be ended, and Ukraine will open. Uh, gates for foreign tourists again. So we hope to see more of you and your friends and relatives here. And again, thank you for your attention and goodbye. If you have some questions, you can let them in the chat and have a good time. Thank you.